All right, good morning and welcome to the House Environment and Energy Committee. This morning, we are going to be hearing from our Department of Forest Parks and Recreation on the Worcester Range um, Long Range Management Plan. Welcome, Commissioner. Great, good morning. Thank you for having us. This is my first time in here this year, so it's good to see you. Well, I stepped in to listen to something, but first time actually at the table. Um, for the record, my name is Daniel Fitzko. I'm the Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation. Uh, I'd like to just provide some high level uh, remarks and then I'll pass it to our team who's going to tell you like uh, what, how we plan, what's in the plan and what's next. Uh, I'm excited for you to, to hear from them because I think they're going to, you'll learn the most from them and they'll probably answer most of your questions. Okay. So, uh, so public lands, uh, they are invaluable state resources. With over 360,000 acres under state ownership, the Agency of Natural Resources is charged with these charged with stewarding these lands for all species, big and small. Public lands, they support our overall well-being, biodiversity and conservation, climate mitigation and resilience, research and education, our cultural and historical resources, local economies, community gathering spaces, incredible scenic views, and the backdrop of our daily lives, and so much more. It's important to remember that managing public lands and our charge and authority is a multifaceted responsibility and requires a holistic perspective that requires the multiple benefits and values that they can provide and the diverse users. The agency takes its responsibility as a stewards of safeguarding these public precious lands very seriously with the ultimate goal of striking a delicate balance to support the well-being of our environment our communities, and future generations. In our role as public land managers, I bet you can imagine we get lots of input, some very specific about a certain recreational asset, or more broadly to do more with this or to do less of that. We are so fortunate to have dedicated professionals who have spent their careers studying, stewarding, and loving these lands to strike the harmonious balance to ensure our public lands play a vital role in meeting today's and tomorrow's opportunities and challenges. In Vermont, we are so fortunate that we have established an approach to our planning and management as a team. In our five districts across the state, staff come together across the agency with their expertise to guide our work. This includes fisheries and wildlife biologists and ecologists, recreation specialists, watershed planners, forest health specialists, and foresters. There is so much richness in bringing this collective voice to the table to make informed management decisions. If you look across the nation, we do it like no other state, and we should celebrate that interdisciplinary approach that we have. The Worcester Range Management Unit, unit which you're interested in, is an incredible gem of nearly 19,000 acres in the heart of several communities in central Vermont. The diverse unit includes popular recreation destinations with mountain biking at Perry Hill Trails in Waterbury, hiking trails up Mount Worcester, Pinnacle and Hunger for breathtaking views, one of the highest waterfalls in the state at Moss Glen Falls, and the crown jewel at Elmore State Park for camping, taking a dip in Lake Elmore, or trekking up to the fire tower. tower. And let's not forget the boundless hunting and fishing opportunities. There are so many opportunities for Vermonters to get out on the land and to bathe in it. It's also a place for all species to thrive. With 27 state significant natural communities, it's part of the Northern Forest and one of the largest continuous forest blocks in the state and an important regional habitat linkage. The Worcester Range and all public lands is something we should celebrate that they are conserved and also trust that we've put forward has been thoughtfully studied, assessed and vetted by experts that are thinking about all species, natural communities, forest health, watersheds, climate mitigation, adaptation, people, and so much more. The same scientists that set the framework for a vision for an ecological functioning landscape and conservation targets are the same team developing long range management plans and stewarding their implementation. Over the past two months, nearly 700 Vermonters took their time to share their feedback and we're grateful for that. We had the same amount from Mount Philo and Charlotte, which is a really heavily high use area. One theme stands out. Vermonters care deeply about our forests and view them 
as a key strategy to address some of the most pressing concerns of our time, climate change, biodiversity collapse, and the associated impacts on human well-being. Many of the comments even go one step further and make an impassionate plea to halt all logging on the Worcester Range, now and forever, suggesting it's the best interest for natural and human worlds. We know these comments are coming from a very good place. Contrary to as it may seem, the comments are our comments and the way that the plan is are coming from the same place that motivates our staff of experts to recommend well-planned, ecologically-based forest management as part of our management actions. Let me explain. Simply put, forest management, management can be a restorative act to help our forests become healthier and more diverse and complex to better withstand the stressors and mitigation of climate change now and into the future. There is no question that our forests are a necessary part of the solution to address the climate crisis, abundant wildlife, provide clean air and water, and provide space for humans to roam. Our expansive forests provide essential connections to the northern landscapes that animals and even plants will migrate towards in pursuit of temperatures conducive of their survival as the climate, climate changes. However, if we ask our forests to provide these benefits into the future, they need to be diverse and complex. The unfortunate reality is that many of our forests are not and exhibit simplified structures. Although they are on the road to recovery, many mid and low elevation forests still bear the, the scar of Vermont's land use history. When stressors pass through these uniform forests, they are at risk to invasive plants, insects, and diseases and the degradation of our ecosystem. To maximize the long-term benefits, we need to make wise management decisions and employ an adaptive approach to forest management that is tailored to the unique conditions of each forest and addresses the need of both nature and people. This involves a spectrum of management strategies from passive to active. We also just released, as directed by the General Assembly, the Vermont Forest Future Strategic Roadmap. The roadmap highlights the value of producing high quality forest products from healthy, resilient, and sustainably managed forests right here in Vermont, where we do it right and where we have a gold standard. Local wood is also part of our climate smart future. I have worked with many foresters over the years, and I can tell you foresters and loggers and everyone across the supply chain it all starts with a love of the forest. And they are always thinking about the future forest. It's not to exploit or to harm them, but rather to foster their health, resilience, and sustainability. I've been with the department for over 20 years, uh, and I have drafted two of Vermont's forest action plans, which is a 10 year broad vision for Vermont's forest that's built on a vision, and I'll quote, the forests of Vermont consist of healthy, sustainable ecosystems and provide significant environmental, social, and economic benefits. And there's broad participation in the stewardship of forests by landowners, businesses, government, and Vermont citizens. The vision for Vermont's forests is really built on five desired future conditions. This is what we're striving for as we go forward. They are conserve native biological diversity across all landscapes maintain and enhance forest ecosystem health and ecological productivity, maintain and enhance forest contribution to ecosystem services, mm -hmm. and maintain and enhance an ethic of respect for the land, sustainable use, and exemplary management. And Vermont has a legal, institutional, and economic framework in place for forest conservation and sustainability. Under the big 10 of the Vermont Forest Action Plan, state lands are one of are just one part of meeting the vision of Vermont's forest. And when forest management is recommended and carried out on state lands, we can show exemplary planning, management and oversight for learning and sharing across Vermont. Public lands are Vermont's lands and it's our team's responsibility at ANR guided by experts to plan for and manage them. We look forward to all reading all the comments, updating the plan, getting out on the land with Vermonters, and continuing to conserve and steward public land for all species in Vermont, big and small, for today and tomorrow.
Thank you for uh, letting me share those high level opening remarks. I'd like to move directly into uh, our team of experts here because they really will get into the details of what's in the plan um, and can kind of foreshadow and tell you what's coming next. If that's okay. Um, you can foreshadow it now or after. Well, I'd, I'd love for them to come up. I'm happy to answer any questions, but they have a lot of good information to share. Yeah. Uh, I think they'll answer a lot of your questions that you may have, um, how we plan, what's in the plan, and they'll talk about what's coming next. Yeah, um, and I guess I would, I hope there'll be time at the end for questions for uh, yeah. all of you. With that, Representative Pat. I have a high, and if, if it can be done later, I have a, a I'm gonna say a high level process uh, question without getting into the details of the proposed <laughs> plan. And I don't know if this is the right time to recommend. Yeah, wait. I but, think maybe we could start with that. Okay. Sure. Okay. Uh, it, it, my understanding that uh, uh, ANR was required by, I think it's Act 59, to come up to promulgate rules for the planning process. And that has not been completed yet. But the um, this this plan was, I'm, I'm going to say, in my communities, dropped uh, without anyone's foreknowledge uh, uh, on on people with with pretty big impact. So I'm just like I, I would like you to address the process question of why that happened, why the, this plan was proposed at this time without having completed uh, the uh, the process that I assume would have involved. A, description and rulemaking of, of uh, uh, a public information process, hopefully before you even propose a plan. Sure, I appreciate the question. So I th there's really two things going on. The way we've set out for planning of the long range management plan is how we typically do that. Our staff do all the assessments, they do a public scoping process, they draft a plan, and then they go back out for public comment. That's how it's been done for years. We have identified an opportunity based on increasing our efficiency without losing our robust assessments and science to eventually go through a rulemaking process for state lands planning. Uh, we have not undertaken that. That is not being directed by anybody. That is something that we've identified as a process improvement in the future for us. Act 59 is uh, the law that you passed last year that sets out the vision for conserving 30 by 30 and 50 by 50. In that planning process, the first step is to inventory state lands. The Worcester Range will be part of that inventory. It also sets out definitions. The plan itself will be due at the end of December 2025. Once the definitions are set through the planning process, we'll be able to identify how they align with our land classification units within our state plans across the state. So we have classification units, definitions are being developed, and we'll be able to crosswalk those once that planning process is done. But the Worcester Range will be considered as part of the conserved land within Act 59. I think, I think though, that Representative was really asking about the requirement for the um, department to promulgate rules for how you do long-range management plans and where you are in that process. Yeah, so we we're not required to do that uh, we are choosing to do that based on some internal assessments for several years that we want to increase our efficiency because we have a lot of state lands and it takes us a lot of time. And so we'd like to do that, but we're not required to. We are choosing to do that for um, our efficiency and, and to maintain really the high quality planning process that we do. Well, we may have a difference of legal opinion on that. I mean, our legislative council has informed us that 2015 you were the department was required by the legislature to promulgate rules for planning. We may have a difference. We just, uh, we are following what our legal counsel is saying as well, that we, are, we don't need to promulgate rule and that we have policies and procedures already in place. So we'll follow up on that, um, but you are promulgating rules. We are in the process of, of designing rules that will eventually, will go through the rulemaking process, yeah. And when will those be completed? Uh, we haven't uh, officially, I don't know yet, but hopefully that sometime this winter or spring, we'll be able to start that process. It's, it's a robust effort. We've been working on it for over two years. As you can imagine, it means a lot and we wanna make sure we get it right. Uh, uh, just w with, or, with or without and whatever the, the legal requirements are or not, 
no one in these communities had any idea that you were working uh, on a, a plan of this magnitude until it was until it was dropped on people. I think we can reflect and, and uh, recognize that we could probably be doing some better public outreach ahead of time. We really try to get the information out there. Um, we've been following what we have been doing, but I think times have changed and I think we need to change as well. And I think we've recognized probably uh, to our benefit and the residents' benefits and Vermonters that we actually do probably some more education and outreach way ahead of time, get out on the land to explain what we're doing. Um, so I, I take that point seriously and as we go forward. Thank you. And I, I have a specific area of concern in the plan, in the plan itself, but we'll get to that later. Thank you. Representative Sevilla. No, oh, I thought you were Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah, um, Commissioner, are you, can you submit your testimony? In, sure. Thank you. <clears throat> my name is Santa Phillips. I'm the State Lands Administration Program Manager. Um, my responsibility is policy and planning that guides state land management I'm in the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, but work across the agency. I'm gonna open by talking about the management planning process broadly. Then we'll talk about the plan specifically and definitely want to reserve time for questions at the end. Um, within the Agency of Natural Resources, as you know, we have three departments. Uh, they have different missions, and I think it's important to call those out because those influence land management decisions and the planning process. So within the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation, our mission is the conservation and management of Vermont's forest resources, the operation and maintenance of state parks, and the promotion and support of outdoor recreation for Vermonters. Alongside the Vermont uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife, mission of which is the conservation of all species of fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats for the people of Vermont, alongside the Department of Environmental Conservation to preserve, enhance, restore, and conserve Vermont's natural resources. So each of these three departmental missions are in service to the agency's larger mission. Each department owns lands that advance the mission of their department. So just to demonstrate the breakdown, the Department of Forest Parks and Recreation owns the majority of lands, approximately 240,000 acres, 185,000 in state forests, the remainder in state parks, followed by the Department of Fish and Wildlife, 135,000 acres, primarily in wildlife management areas, and then Department of Environmental Conservation owns roughly 2,000 acres of lands, which are primarily lands associated with dams that they own and manage. And as I mentioned, each department owns lands and manages lands towards the specific um, mission of their department. NVSA 2603 provides a bit more direction about management of FPR lands. Um, this phrase is particularly helpful. The commissioner shall manage and plan for the use of publicly owned forests and parklands in order to implement the policy and purposes of this chapter, promote and protect the natural productive and recreational values of such lands and provide for multiple uses of the lands in the public interest. Although we own lands that advance the purposes of each department, we collectively um, agree that agency land management and planning is strengthened by collaboration between the three departments. And we've actually structured our work to reflect this concept and this core <clears throat> principle in practice. So throughout this process, you may have interacted with, heard about the district stewardship team, state lands across the state are split into five districts. Each district has what is called the district stewardship team. And we staff those teams with experts from across the three departments, which contain at a minimum and often more, a stewardship forester who's the chair of the committee, a state lands forester, a recreation specialist, the parks regional manager, those are within FPR, there's always a wildlife biologist, at least one, a fisheries biologist, the state lands ecologist from within Fish and Wildlife, and then from DEC, we have uh, the basin planner. The district stewardship teams are responsible for management of lands within their district, and they're also responsible for drafting and developing those long-range management plans like the Worcester Range Plan. The teams meet monthly and discuss the development of plans and management of those lands. Above them is what we call the agency land stewardship team. Those are essentially directors who have supervisory responsibilities over the state land management staff. The lands team is responsible for developing and adopting policies that guide state land management and also reviewing those final draft plans before they're ultimately recommended to agency leadership 
to sign off on. So the ultimate decision about a plan, a policy, a practice, et cetera, belongs to agency leadership, the commissioners and the secretary. But um, ultimately, the district stewardship team is making recommendations to the lands team who's recommending to leadership. This is really core to everything we do, um, and I want to just explain why. Um, this concept and the associated staffing structure, I think, is one of the most underappreciated aspects of how we do our work. Um, and we think is an enormous public benefit. Here's why. Um, we center the experts in our decision making. Those recommendations in the management plan are coming from the people who know the land base best, who have spent their field season out walking around the land, visiting the resources that are their particular lens of focus. They're experts in their field. They've devoted their careers to the work that they're doing um, and are often contributing sort of at the leading edge of science um, to inform management of lands across large landscape scales in the face of the various crises that Danny brought up in her introduction. And finally, I think this is pretty important. Um, while many of these staff have other job duties, state lands are where they really have the opportunity to translate their expertise into practice. For them, it's exciting, it's expiring, inspiring, and for many, it's why they chose this career in the first place. So um, it's something they all really enjoy. Um, and I think it's of enormous public benefit that we're putting 12 to 14 experts around the table to spend time together monthly talking about what really is the most logical, intelligent decision for this particular land base. Um, and this level of staff engagement leads us to a plan that we're proud to share that proposes management informed by the best available science and that we think Vermonters can have confidence in um, that it was prepared with care and knowledge of the land base in question. So why management plan? Uh, this is pretty important foundational question. Why do we do this in the first place? Uh, we accomplish a few things through management planning. First, it gives us the landscape scale resource planning and management perspective. It allows us to think about the multiple uses and think about how we balance them, not only across a particular management unit, but across the full state lands portfolio. It allows us to understand public desires and opinion. It creates space for us to provide the opportunities that the public is seeking and that are consistent with the agency and department missions and policies. And then also equally important, it allows us to establish continuity of management vision across staff. These are generally 20 year plans. Staff turns over in that time that ensures we're taking the long view. This is the process in a nutshell. We begin with each of those natural resource assessments. That's a lengthy process. Spend lots of time in the field collecting the information that's in the plan. We then move on to public scoping, which I also consider really the assessment of public opinion, public interest in those lands. That was completed in 2020. Worth noting that um, through the public scoping process, we received roughly 725 comments. And that's alongside the roughly 700 comments that we received on the draft plan management plan. So we did have very high public engagement in the scoping process that was completed in 2020. We then prepare a draft management plan that was released on December 1st. We collected public comment between December 13th and February 2nd on that draft management plan. We hosted two public meetings, one in Worcester, one in Stowe. Those were recorded. They're still available to view online. Now we're in the process of reading all of the comments received. So every member of that 12 person district stewardship team will review all of the comments received. Um, that's obviously going to take some time. So we've really just started that process um, and are beginning to process the, the all of the comments that came in through various avenues. And then we move on to developing um, an updated management plan. I'm going to provide a really high level overview of the Worcester range. I'm going to skip the slides that we prepared that are really specific to the resources because I want to make sure we get to the management recommendations as well. But before I skip those slides, I'm, I'm just going to point out that the plan it's long is available on our website and goes into detail about each of those individual natural resources. So um, as we opened with the Worcester range, um, it's almost 19,000 acres right in central Vermont. It's in the Northern Green Mountains biophysical region, and it contains a number of prominent features uh, that you may be familiar with, including Hunger Mountain, Elmore State Park, the Perry Hill Trails in Waterbury, Stowe Pinnacle, the Middlesex Notch Wildlife Management Area, and the new Brownsville Forest Acquisition Stowe. 
Here's the breakdown of ownership across the departments. The ma large majority of that is in FPR ownership, almost 18,000 acres is CC Putnam State Forest. Just about 1,000 acres of that is Elmore State Park. Fish and Wildlife owns a little less than 1,000 acres across two wildlife management areas. And then also worth noting, there are some um, non-fee ownership interests as easements adjacent um, to the fee ownership that creates this connected landscape. Whenever we do a management plan, it's important that we consider state lands in the larger landscape context and what's going on around it. Uh, this is very, um, it's situated right in the core of a pretty remarkable conserved landscape. So just to note some of the recent large um, protected lands immediately adjacent, some of the former, former Atlas timberlands are now protected with working forest easements, the Vermont Land Trust, Worcester Woods Forest Legacy Easement, and the uh, new Northeast Wilderness Trust Woodbury Mountain Preserve are all part of this connected landscape. Uh, this is part of a um, important forest block and connectivity block as identified through Vermont Conservation Design. It's entirely within, it forms the core of two 45,000 acre highest priority blocks for intact forest and habitat connectivity. And it's part of a critical north, south, and east, west linkage for wildlife movement. So you can see the Worcester Range outlined in black here. It's a key connection between the Adirondacks and Western Mass, north and east to Maine, New Brunswick, and all the way up to the Gaspé Peninsula, providing that critical connectivity um, for wildlife to move as the climate changes. It provides that critical ecological and wildlife connection from the northern Green Mountains to the northeastern highlands. And it also provides connections west to Bolton Mountain and Mount Mansfield and south across Route 2 and Interstate 89. These are the sections that I'm going to cruise through really quickly just so we can get to the next part of our slide, but just noting um, 27 natural community types and a notable diversity of species with communities ranging from low elevation floodplain forest all the way up to high elevation boreal forest. Um, enormous variation in wildlife habitat, as you can imagine across 19,000 acres, featuring deer wintering area, hard mass feeding areas, mapped vernal pools, and again, that large contiguous interior forest. There are a number of notable recreation highlights, 43 total miles of trail in the Worcester Range, broken down by type, that's 10 miles of mechanized or multi-use trail, six miles of motorized trail, 27 miles of pedestrian trail, and it features, as I mentioned before, some well-known and popular recreation destinations. Um, Highlights on the water resources, just noting the extensive headwater network in the Lake Champlain, Winooski and Lamoille watershed basins. Um, popular water resources for humans include Moss Glen Falls and Lake Elmore. Um, also, because of the mountainous terrain, um, important to call out that groundwater is abundant in the mountains, resulting in frequent seepage at the surface and a series of headwater wetlands. And a number of small pocket wetlands are widespread and provide important landscape diversity across the range. So um, in just a moment, we're, I'm going to hit on these couple of high-level slides about the management plan overview, and then I'll turn it over to Jim. I wanted to just start by calling out the major management proposals that in some way represent a change from what has occurred there and what people know is, is happening on the Worcester Range. So first, um, this draft management plan proposes expanding the highly sensitive management area classification by approximately 5,500 acres, that's 29% of the unit, that more than doubles the amount of highly sensitive management area that we already have in the unit, and I'll show you a map of that in a moment. It's proposing forest management on almost 2,000 acres, which is 10% of the unit. Jim will talk more about that in a moment. It's establishing management direction for new acquisitions. So uh, the Brownsville Forest is a new acquisition, as well as the Patterson Brook headwaters on the east side. So because those were recently taken into state ownership, they're not part of um, an existing management plan for this unit. The plan also formalizes some pre-existing recreational uses like mountain bike use at Brownsville Forest and winter biking at Perry Hill. So this um, is essentially making that our management plan into the future. And then it's proactively managing some unauthorized recreational uses. So that's things like uh, trail development where uh, people didn't seek state permission to do that, and this is identifying that and uh, saying where we're going to be proactive in addressing that. 
One of the main outputs of the plan is the assignment of the land management classifications. These four categories indicate where different types of management will be emphasized. Based on our assessments, each acre is assigned to one of four classifications. The first is highly sensitive management area. These are places where uncommon or outstanding resources and where protection of those resources is the primary management consideration. 52% of the unit is recommended to fall into this category in this plan cycle. <laughs> special management are places where unique or special resources exist, where the protection or enhancement of these resources is an important management consideration. General management, these are areas that can support a variety of uses or management actions. Within these areas, management is focused on sustainable use of resources and minimizing conflicts. And intensive management is areas characterized by high levels of human activity. These are places like state parks or trailheads. So the proposed breakdown in the first draft was 52% highly sensitive management area, 23% special management, 25% general management, and a nominal percentage intensive management. Can I just have me pause and <clears throat> for my own edification, go back through, I'm familiar with the highly sensitive management, but reiterate perhaps the special and the general and the difference between, and, and intensive, and what the differences are on the ground. Yes, so within each of these high level categories, we have a series of subclasses. Um, so special management, the language is unique or special resources where the protection or enhancement of these resources is an important management consideration. The subclasses within special management are highly variable, um, and I'm happy to provide the list of what those subclasses are, but what that looks like on the ground could actually look very different depending on what subclass it's falling into. Is it fair to say it might be management for a particular species? Yes. And general management, um, oops, excuse me, does not have as many subclasses. Uh, and so I think this, this phrase captures it. These are areas that su can support a variety of uses or management actions. Management is focused on sustainable use of resources and minimizing conflicts. Intensive is like... Intensive is um, characterized by high levels of human activity. So that's like state parks and trailheads we delineate as intensive. Management for a campground or a parking lot or- a Exactly, yeah. So this is um, providing a bit more detail about that proposed increase in the highly sensitive management area. In black on this map, you can see the already classified highly sensitive management area from the previous management cycle. So this, this is and was a little over 4,000 acres. The large majority of that is uh, the Worcester Range natural area, which covers the spine of the Worcester Range. And then uh, the little one in the top left is the Moss Glen Falls natural area. That's just 80 acres. So two distinct natural areas that are classified into that HSMA category. This plan proposes 5,500 acres of new HSMA additions um, in two locations. The first is the Moss Glen watershed area. We have, a, um, I think, a quick question from Representative Bonger. I guess I'm just curious about um... <clears throat> The term management, and in the, like in the first category, already classified the highly sensitive management area. Does that mean that you just basically let it be it be, be not be itself, or is there active management, or what does that mean in that context? The first two here. It doesn't explicitly prohibit management. It's management um, that promotes those unique or special resources or is consistent with protection of those unique or special resources. So then how would it be different from highly sensitive management area? <clears throat> I mean, or yeah, I mean, I guess I'm confused on highly sensitive management. Sorry, how would it be different from special management area? I think it might be helpful to after this, actually provide the more detailed description of each of these. What I've shared with you is my paraphrased description of those. And I know that the details of our land management classifications are probably going to be helpful to answer some of these questions and also the subclasses. Yeah, okay, they will be.
So um, to just elaborate on the two areas where we are, we are proposing expanding the highly sensitive management area, the first is um, what we're calling the Moss Glen Basin expansion. That area feeds the Moss Glen Falls natural area and it adds low elevation stands to our highly sensitive management classification area. Um, that was really motivated by a desire to connect those two natural areas. Um, and the group has done that uh, through the HSMA designation. And then the second area to expand is adding, uh, essentially dropping that elevational line around the Worcester Range natural area and adding mid elevation natural communities to our highly sensitive management classification area. Um, these are also areas within fragile soils and that um, when you take both of those into consideration, the majority of that uh, 4,200 acres is um, that mid elevation inclusion, essentially dropping the elevational line. And then 1,200 acres is that connection, pr providing that connection between the Moss Glen natural area and um, the Worcester Range natural area. And what are you dropping the elevation to? Okay. Yeah, back to you. I don't remember the line. Madam Chair, if I may, Robert Zano, ecologist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. I believe that we used uh, a combination of natural communities and some practical boundary delineations to identify that highly sensitive management area. So some of it was based on uh, the configuration of the land, but also the, the mapping of natural communities that was done during the assessment phase. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Jim Duncan. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hannah. Thank you for the opportunity to uh, present here. My name is Jim Duncan, and I'm the State Lands Manager with the Division of Forests and Forest Parks and Recreation. And my role is to oversee the five districts or forestry staff that do state lands management, specifically our stewardship foresters, state lands foresters, and the outdoor recreation specialists. So I'm going to speak to you about the some of the specific forest management and other management proposals in the plan. Um, before I dive into the specific management actions for the Worcester Range, I think it's valuable to take a step back and share what we mean by the term active forest management. FPR's approach to forest management is guided by statute, as we know, 10 VSA 2601 and 2603. And we use science-based practices and tools to maintain or improve forest conditions. We use ecologically informed and sustainable forestry to identify when interventions are needed to maintain forest health or improve landscape level diversity and, when appropriate, apply active forest management techniques. Active forest management includes a number of activities that manipulate trees, shrubs, and other plants, such as timber harvests, invasive plant treatments, encouraging food producing trees, and stand improvement to give healthy trees more space to grow. Our dedicated staff of professional foresters working with our colleagues from across the agency have the training, education, and experience to develop the forest management activities informed by the latest science, and they do it exceptionally well. Our robust environmental reviews conducted at each stage of project development ensure that not only are our timber harvests and all our active management done sustainably, they are done in ways that manage or improve, but not degrade forests as a whole and meet our statutory obligations. On the Worcester Range specifically, this plan proposes to use 13 harvests across 1,935 treatment acres over the 20-year plan. That's 10% of the total land area. Another 38% of the unit, we propose other active forest management approaches to maintain existing features or respond to changes, including invasive plant control, master crop tree release, and pruning, such as for apples and oaks, open land and young forest management, and ecosystem restoration. On 52% of the unit, we propose passive or very limited management, largely letting natural processes prevail. As we know, the forests of the Worcester Range provide numerous ecosystem services, such as clean air, clean water, carbon storage, wildlife habitat, and climate regulation. These services provide a variety of benefits to the people of Vermont. The forest management activities proposed in the plan are intended to maintain these benefits and services and meet the many goals and objectives of found within the LRMP with a long range plan. And the map shown here identifies the, a zoom out of all the treatment areas and a zoom in on the 
CC Putnam Forest in particular to show the treatment schedule and locations. There's been a lot of discussion about timber harvest, so I thought it'd be helpful to talk about why we do state uh, timber harvest on state lands. When justified by the conditions on the ground and the latest science, timber harvests are a powerful tool when combined with other techniques to achieve many goals of the plan and maintain the benefits and services Vermonters have come to expect from forests. We can use timber harvests to address the legacy of past land use practices, such as large-scale clearing for agriculture and subsequent abandonment that has left many of our forests in a state far from their pre-contact condition. We can use timber harvests to make forests less susceptible to pests and diseases and prepare them for a range of stresses from climate change to invasive plants. We can even use timber harvests to accelerate the development of old forest characteristics by diversifying species and age classes and adding woody debris to the ground and creating more standing dead trees. Timber harvests are a critical tool in state lands because they can be done at scale, affordably and sustainably to maintain and enhance Vermont's forests and address the many things that we think about as natural resource managers. Timber harvests on state lands also generate forest products that Vermonters want and need, everything from home heating to flooring to furniture to electricity as well as good jobs in rural communities. Some stands on state lands are well suited to sustainably produce these forest products on an ongoing basis. The fact that we can meet some of Vermont's need locally on exceptionally well-managed lands instead of exporting our consumption to places where forests may not be managed as thoughtfully is something that we take pride in. And it's all of these outcomes that drive the use of timber harvest on state lands and never revenue. Looking at the types of harvest Vermonters might see on state lands, it's important to acknowledge when we do what. Patch cuts, where most of the trees in a given area are cut, can be a valuable tool for certain forest conditions, such as a forest dominated by diseased beech. Take the stand in Groton State Forest, where the overstory beech outnumbered all other trees three to one, and the understory was 80% beech, and nearly all of that beech was diseased with beech bark disease, an invasive pest complex. Harvests like this one shown here open up the forest floor to sunlight, giving species other than beech a chance to establish, diversifying the forest and restoring a more balanced mix of conditions and a better forest health overall. And it's important to remember that patch cuts like these become vibrant, healthy forests once more, as shown in this patch cut from Coolidge State Forest 30 years ago that has regrown into a diverse forest, adding resilience and complexity <clears throat> across the landscape. We, we have a question from Representative Bongard. Quick question about when you do the patch cuts, how do you keep invasives from split work? Oh, yeah. Some place that I worked before we tried doing forestry, we just gave up because it meant lacing it with chemicals if we were going to do. So we we just gave up. So okay. what, what do you do to keep invasives from taking over? So if invasives are not already present on the site, uh, we use a, we have a really robust cleaning requirement for any material, any machinery that comes on state lands to prevent introduction of invasives onto that land base. For areas that have already established invasive plant populations, we have uh, we use a range of techniques from mechanical pulling and grinding to herbicide application ahead of treatment for specific plant populations to pre-treat those areas so that once the other uh, trees are removed, you don't allow light to these invasive plants. So we can do targeted treatment of specific populations before harvest to prevent spread and further establishment of those invasive plants afterwards. And then there's a whole other range of techniques that we can use, but those are kind of the two mechanical or chemical treatment. We, we just found that that just didn't work. You had to do it like six times and just keep putting on more and more. Depending on where you are in the state, it's a significant challenge. But if we wanted to talk more about some of those uh, invasive plant control mechanisms, I'd be happy to bring someone in to do that. We definitely have a, um, lots of questions. So briefly, Representative Smith and then Pat. And, yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, you're still concentrating on the Worcester Range right now, aren't you? I am. Okay. My question, uh, I don't know if there are any hunting or fishing restrictions that pertain right now, but if there are, could you let me know? Uh, or do you plan on having any hunting or fishing restrictions on that range? There are no plans for any hunting or fishing restrictions. Are there none now? There are none now, unless I'm sorry, not thinking of any, but that's Good. Uh, My other question is, when you're planning to cut, isn't there a 40 acre law or a clear cut law that you have to get permission to go over 40 acres? 
Yes, yeah, so you have a heavy cut body um, requires and it's cumulative over time. The patch cuts that happen on state land are well are in the single digit number of acres. So we're not talking anything at the scale of a 40 acre clear patch cut or clear cut. So um, it's an entirely different scale of operations. We just don't have those types of large scale operations on state lands. If the cumulative effect over time triggers that heavy cut law, we do a review uh, through that process, but we are never doing a 40 acre clear cut. Thank you. Representative Pat. Thank you. Um, you've mentioned uh, at a relative at a high level what the benefits are of of, of uh, forestry practices. Does the plan the plan the, the Worcester Range Plan uh, in terms of the specific locations um, uh, in Middlesex and Worcester uh, state exactly what the benefits are for those specific um, uh, locations? Just to make sure the question is, does the plan state what those specific benefits are for each location? In those, in those communities, in those towns, yes. The plan does not currently state the um, long-term goals for those stands. And that's something that uh, in addressing the comments, I think we can address in the plan, in the revised version of the plan, potentially uh, we can explain that better because right now that plan text does not include those statements. Thank you. Because the concern, the, probably the biggest concern is about the, um, impact on water flows downstream from there, uh, which you may have heard from in some of the, some of the comments. And, they're very, and from my point of view, very incredibly serious concerns. So. Absolutely. And I have a slide on water resources where I think we can address that a little bit more. So I can come back to that if that's all right with you, Representative. Okay. So I want to just make a quick public service announcement. We've told our next witness that we're running, we're going to be running over. So we'll have uh, an extra, you know, 15 minutes. Okay. I'll try and keep it brief. Thank you for that. We want to make sure, no, I'm not asking you to necessarily cruise through. Just want to okay. let folks know we can take a little moment. We don't have to rush. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> so moving on just again to other types of timber harvests that one might expect to see on state lands. These are um, examples of more limited harvests that involve single trees, groups, smaller patches that can spur growth and add complexity, give smaller tree spaces to grow and increase habitat structure across the entire landscape. The selection of the appropriate harvest type is driven by the unit goals and the site, and that's made based on conditions on the ground and <laughs> includes a, another round of robust environmental review and planning across our agency. Climate change is a topic of great concern to all resource managers, and we can be all but certain that it will impact the forests of the Worcester Range. All of our resource management strategies in the plan embed climate change considerations in their management. Looking specifically at forests and forest management, climate change may alter growing conditions, create longer growing seasons, favor invasive plants and pests, cause stress to seedlings and saplings, and increase the risk of drought and fire. Uh, it can also impact operability for active management, increase the risk to forest management road and trail infrastructure, especially around rain events. Furthermore, research and modeling suggests we'll see a relatively slow pace of change in our forest species mix in the absence of disturbance in our region. We've embedded numerous mitigation strategies in the plan to lessen these impacts. Uh, these include matching the harvesting and management equipment to the site to improve, uh, sorry, to the site, retaining woody debris in active management areas, improving our management infrastructure like roads and trails to be resilient to flooding and heavy rain events, and improving forest structure and age class diversity to make stands resilient to fire, wind, and drought, as well as managing against non-native plants, pests, and vast pathogens, all of which bring climate change, resilience, and adaptation and mitigation benefits. Uh, much of this management unit has no active habitat management and functions in a more or less natural state. Cooperation across the agency, we uh, can use active civil cultural treatments and timber harvest to create structural diversity and to maintain intact forests, as well as enhancing wildlife food sources, as I alluded to earlier. We can create complex forests to support more wildlife species and habitats with a variety of ages and cover types. And we assign those land management classifications explicitly to protect wildlife movement corridors and make sure that those areas of priority connectivity are preserved. Uh, this management unit has a large diversity of recreational opportunities with varying levels of intensity of use, and that diversity can and does overlap with wildlife habitat mm -hmm. in several locations. Um, and this just shows the use of land management classifications to uh, maintain that critical connectivity corridor. Recreation is a big topic on the Worcester Range. Briefly, some of the management actions in the plan as proposed are managing our new parcel of Brownsville, 
having uh, dispersing use uh, and better managing use at Stowe Pinnacle, improving trail sustainability at several locations, and managing our access pressure, pressures, which are significant at some of these locations listed, including the Waterbury Trail, Pinnacle Meadows, Stowe Pinnacle, Moss Glen Falls, and Middlesex. And finally, uh, managing unauthorized uses and uh, making sure that those uses don't create downstream impacts on other resources across the system. Um, finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about managing for water quality and flood resilience. The goals and strategies in the plan focus on maintaining and enhancing forested areas surrounding surface waters. Uh, we focus on protecting water quality, maintaining and improving stream connectivity, improving fish habitat and natural stream processes, and improving angler access and promoting fishing opportunities. In addition, there are tactics currently underway across state lands that include strategic wood additions to streams to promote more complex stream structure, provide fish habitat, and a significant effort underway to upgrade legacy roads, including old forest roads and skid trails that may have predated state ownership that are now a current source of sedimentation. And we are working actively on upgrading those legacy roads to our latest AMP standards to address <clears throat> some of the downstream flooding concerns that uh, really can be driven by the infrastructure more than the vegetation removal from timber harvests. So we're using our timber, our forest management to go in and fix those issues for the next flood. I, I actually have a question on that because that's one of my issues is um, in seeing the post flood state of the in forest in my neck of the woods. Um, you're exactly right. It's the road infrastructure that's causing a lot of the challenges. And I guess I'm wondering, do you ever remove roads or um, does this plan include the removal of any of those roads? Because it seems to me it's not just how the roads are built, but it's that they're there at all in these very sensitive areas and they are you know, increasing the surface area of impervious surfaces. Um, it's hard to know what size to size a culvert, particularly high up in these watersheds in the current state of our climate. And I'm just curious, does this plan have any plan for removing any road infrastructure? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Existing state forest highways are gonna be maintained in this road plan, in this plan. Uh, there are legacy, uh, I believe there are legacy roads that will be closed out that may not be fully closed out. Um, defining whether a road is open or not is, is challenging when you get into old logging roads. In areas where we're doing active management, we would use that timber harvest as an opportunity to address those past road maintenance practices. And this plan explicitly calls for using our acceptable management practices and meeting all the recommendations and requirements in there on all of our roads. And we're fortunate to have a really um, fortunate and unfortunate to have a really clear example of how well these AMP uh, interventions work on our forest roads. The July floods showed us that sections of road that have been upgraded to these standards essentially uh, came through unscathed. Sections immediately down uh, slope from those roads that hadn't yet been treated had serious erosion impacts. So we know that these AMPs work to prevent erosion, to disperse water off of the road and into the landscape and utilize forest buffers and existing infrastructure to vent downstream uh, cascading effects from high event, high flow events uh, in our, and high precipitation events. Because it is a challenge, but one that we're slowly be, or starting to be able to pick away at. There's any seconds. Yeah, I'd like to follow up on the, on the road question I just asked. Um, in your slide, you talk about big chunks of this area being basically left alone, that there's not going to be active management under this plan. Are there roads through those areas? I believe there are certain roads that are either management roads, and I believe a vast trail goes through a portion of this. And I'd have to go back to the plan to look explicitly on what the uh, road system is within those areas. If, if we're not thinking that there's going to be active management on those areas, why would we need why would we be maintaining forest roads, logging roads? That's a good question. The uh, definition of a highly sensitive management area is about the range and intensity of management tools that are allowed. There is limited management allowed in highly sensitive management areas, not strictly passive management requirement. Um, so addressing there was an invasive plant population that became established in a highly sensitive management area. Mechanical or chemical treatment could happen in an HSMA if there was a road that had um, natural resource. It was, natu it was causing natural resource degradation. Managing that road 
is in line with the HSMA because it's preserving and ensuring that the resource values of that HSMA are not compromised by other activities. So we would use management when it's needed to protect those areas and protect the reasons that those areas are designated. The range of tools we have is very limited in an HSMA. So for example, timber harvest and salvage logging are not compatible with an HSMA according to the plan as written. But I can also look into that road question more. Um, I would have, I want to come back with some more information. So if that's something I can provide representative, uh, that would be helpful. I think that, yeah, that would be helpful. I'm, I'm, you know, we've heard a lot in this committee about the incredible value of old forests. And I would, I would very much, this, this seems like a really wonderful opportunity for us to maximize old forests in this one small part of the state. Uh, given the fact that it's publicly owned and it's a pretty large, relatively large contiguous area. Um, and it's the way I understand it, old, old forests aren't really compatible with road networks. So I would love to hear more about how those interface. Representative, that's a fantastic segue to the next slide, which is our VCD old forest targets and uh, Bob Zanar, state ecologist. Um, I would, if it's okay, we can move on to that and maybe a good time to talk about that. Morning. Uh, for the record, Robert Zeno, ecologist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife. I just want to talk very briefly about Vermont conservation design, if that's possible. Um, I know you've heard enough about Vermont conservation design. You can probably give the presentations now. Uh, Not as well as you. <laughs> just to, to step back to start um, talking about the intersection of Vermont conservation design and state lands planning. And if you'll indulge me a few personal comments here. I started working on state lands ecology in 2008. My very first inventory project was natural community inventory and assessment in the Worcester range. Uh, I was out on the ground actually finding and mapping these natural communities that have ultimately been used to inform the development of the plan. I also did some quick math. I think something like a dozen or more years uh, serving on all five of the district stewardship teams, uh, monthly meetings for each of the five districts, uh, maybe two or three hours for each meeting, well over 1,200 hours of sitting around a table discussing the ins and outs of state mm -hmm. lands management and how we can do the best management possible considering all of the different values, uh, uses, uh, and benefits of that land. I think that is a testament to how well our state is doing this state lands management. And when I've gone to regional conferences, national conferences with other ecologists, told them what I do, that I, I'm there at the table doing this work they're universally impressed with our system. They're jealous of our system. So I just wanted to offer that uh, perspective of our land management process in the state. Back to Vermont conservation design. You know, Vermont conservation design is a statewide vision for maintaining ecological function. It's broad. It encompasses forest blocks, riparian areas, and then finer scale features. It offers some broad guidance for how to maintain those. And some of that guidance depends on the scale of the feature. The guidance for maintaining forest blocks is much broader than the guidance for maintaining a rare natural community. Even with all that, VCD is not a parcel by parcel management plan. It was never intended to be a parcel by parcel management plan. So you can't just say, well, Vermont conservation design has this, therefore the land management for a particular parcel is this. The land management for a particular parcel should be guided by what's on the ground, the land use history, uh, the uh, public values and benefits, everything that is going on in that stewardship team discussion is, I think, the appropriate implementation of Vermont conservation design to a particular place. I also just want to emphasize that uh, Vermont conservation design envisions a whole range of strategies for maintaining forests and the, the ecological functions of forests. It has old forest where there's very little management young forest with very intensive management to maintain that special habitat, and then a broad range of uh, forests where a, a well-managed well, well -managed forest that's consistent with maintaining forest blocks and their ecological functions. And the Worcester Range Plan is using that strategy. I wanted to kind of uh, share a little bit of analysis I've been working on, and 
this may be something if you're interested in it, it it's probably not going to be something that's easily done in five minutes. And I'd be happy to explain more about this if you would like at another time. But we have targets for old forest in each of the state's biophysical region in the Northern Green Mountains. It's 95,000 acres. I've been partnering with the Wildlands, Woodlands, Farmlands and Communities Organization and Harvard Forest to look at their assessment of wildlands in New England. So places that are mostly passively managed, in my opinion, very likely to become old forest over time. Using that to get a gauge of where we are towards achieving those targets for old forest in each of our biophysical regions. Using that data, uh, it's roughly 80,000 acres, 81,000 acres of wildlands in the Northern Green Mountain region. That includes the Worcester Range natural area. It does not include those 5,500 acres uh, that my colleagues just shared that are now going into that highly sensitive management area and following the methodology used in that Harvard Forest Wildlands Woodlands uh, report would now be counted as a new wildlands. So we can up that 81,000 acres to uh, what 86,500 based on this new plan. Putting that into perspective across the state, we're actually doing really well towards our old forest, our future old forest targets in the Northern Greens. This is not all old forest now, but the idea is that it can become that. Uh, same with the Southern Greens, but when we look across the state, those are two regions that are, we've, we've really done a lot towards those targets. The other regions of the state are places where there's much more work to do. I think that matters because as we close that gap in the Northern Greens, a relatively small gap, I think we should be very thoughtful and strategic about the types of places that we are setting aside to become old forest over time. And we should really focus on the representation of natural communities. And uh, the VCD old target is not just an acreage number, it's proportional representation of the primary matrix broad forest natural communities in the region. And what this, this uh, bar chart here is showing in the green is sort of the rough balance of six main matrix forest types in the Northern Greens. And the blue bars are representing the current wildland or future old forest conservation status or how those, say this right, how those communities are represented in those wildlands. So when the blue bar is above the green bar, it means we've got more of that than would be proportional. And that's high elevation spruce fir forests. Where the blue bar is below the green bar, it's a type of natural community where we can uh, represent, we should represent more of it to have that full ecological representation. And the one on the very, uh, what would that be, your right, uh, where the blue bar is almost non-visible and the green bar is high, that's low elevation hemlock forest. And that's, that's very poorly represented in uh, future old forest in the Northern Greens. And on the map there, which shows a portion of CC Putnam State Forest, the, the community that's poorly represented is that turquoise blue color. You can see there's very little of it in CC Putnam. And if I had showed the whole Worcester Range unit, the point would essentially be the same. So we can't, just using the Worcester Range, we're not gonna achieve uh, those natural community representation goals for future old forest. What I'm hoping is that by expanding this analysis, I think we should be looking broader at all of the opportunities for future old forest and thinking about where we can strategically find that natural community representation. And I hope that this will be the type of work that gets uh, considered in the Act 59 process where we'll be thinking broadly about uh, all types of land conservation and how to balance that to achieve that statewide conservation plan. I, I, I... I want to go back to your previous slide, just to make sure I understand it. Sure. And what the difference between wildland weak and wildland strong is on the bars. Yes, great question. It's a reflection of the permanence of the uh, protection uh, mechanism for the land. And I think if I have this right, uh, this was uh, what Harvard Forest and Wildlands and Woodlands, uh, they made this determination, not me. Uh, Strong wildlands would be things like federal wilderness areas or state natural areas where there is, or an easement where there's like a third party protection to it. And then the weak wildlands uh, would be areas that might be administratively designated, but not have that additional layer of protection. Or like a highly sensitive management area. Yes, correct. And uh, um, do we have, you said, you said state lands 
with a third party. We have some state land natural areas with an easement or other third party involvement. I think uh, we do. This is seeing nods. I don't know if I want to. Oh, yeah. I guess things like chemistry would be the, uh, the example of that. Or because uh, there's a deed restriction on it. Yeah. Okay. I, I actually. Um, I will double check whether I believe state natural areas are included in strong because of the uh, extra levels of protection, but I'm not certain of that. Is it okay if I jump? Sure. Up? Yeah. The uh, the wildland strong, uh, the ones that I can say confidently are coming from state lands or the state natural areas, um, and that is they did analysis of the process that it would take to essentially reverse that. State natural areas are designated. Um, they require public process, and then they're signed into effect by the governor. So to reverse a state natural area would require the signature of the governor and public process. So in their analysis, that put it in strong state lands weak, as you said, highly sensitive management areas. Those are designated through the long range management planning process. Hypothetically, those could be changed from management plan to management plan. Realistically, and why they ended up in this analysis, the qualifying characteristics that turn something into a highly sensitive management area are not likely to change on the ground, and therefore they probably remain in that category that landed them in the wildland paint designation. Thank you. That's a Senate bill. Don't worry about us. <laughs> well, that, that's the slides that I had on Vermont Conservation Design and the Worcester Range Plan. I'm happy to take any more questions, otherwise I'll turn it back over to my colleagues. That's, I think, and, and Representative Tory has a question. I, I know I do, and you offered to come back. I think we will definitely take you up on that offer. And so if you have a quick question for now, we'll try. And okay. then we do need to be aware of time. Sure, I think it's a good question. Uh, you mentioned 30 by 30, the bill we worked on last year. Um, so in your opinion, is there any reason to hold up this management plan pending Act 59? I guess I might respectfully defer that to the commissioners. I think that uh, we're constantly working on plans. And uh, I mean, like I said, this has been a, a long time coming to get this Worcester plan together. And uh, it does seem like there's always the next thing, but maybe I'd turn that over to Commissioner Fitzgerald. Yeah, uh, I think I answered this a little bit earlier that uh, at this point, we feel like what's in the Worcester Manager Plan aligns well with Act 59. It's just aligning those definitions when they come out after the inventory, because the Worcester Range will be part of the inventory as all state lands. And we have these land management classification units, which will eventually line up at some point when we get there with the definitions, which are still being worked on. Hi, Logan. Just to follow up on that, um, Commissioner, uh, could you imagine at, uh, as a result of the planning processes related to Act 59 that then some adjustments to the management plan for the Worcester Range would need to be made? I think it's too early to tell that. I don't, I, we'll see. We have 360,000 acres that we manage for. So whatever comes out of it, we'll look at holistically across the state to all our lands that we manage and the land classification units. Uh, I think what we have here in the Worcester Range, if we're looking at the different definitions, we're heavy on what I would think would be the ecological reserves area, which would, I would guess would be 50 some percent of, of the unit uh, and less on the natural resource management. In really? some areas, based on the landscape, will be at different percentages. It's, right there, yeah. it's really based on ecological assessments of the work that the staff does. But I think we should be proud that how much is act is in here, and then it's it's grounded in in science and truth on assessments. Representative Stebbins, did you have a question? And then Pat, thanks, Bunger. Um, You know, I I hear the need for management, particularly as it relates to invasive species. And I love beech trees, but three to one in that they have, uh, you know, bark disease. That uh, So I hear that. I guess I remain just really concerned about uh, down downstream flooding and how that's managed if you clear cut and, uh, you know, have that timber harvesting. So I, I maybe you guys will come back later, but... Um, that that seems pretty concerning to me. I can try and address that quickly if, if you want. It's all right. 
Um, when you actually, when you speak again, just say for the record, your name. Uh, for the record, this is Jim Duncan, State Lands Manager. There's, there's a lot to get into in that, but I think at a fundamental level, we can look uh, just in New Hampshire at the Hubbardbrook uh, Research Forest, and they've done uh, paired watershed studies that included completely clear cutting and herbicide an entire watershed and comparing the water yield from one to, from that to one that was not treated at all. And even that complete nuking of a hillside or of a watershed generated a uh, very little change overall in the peak stream flows, really affected low flows in uh, treatments that are more uh, typical of what we would see on a small patch cut in Vermont. Um, they found very negligible, very limited and short-lived changes to stream flow on the order of years. Again, not at peak flows, but on the low flows. So I think there's a lot of good science at Hubbard Brook that has shown the um, limited effects of vegetation removal. And in concert, there are many studies that show the importance of the road infrastructure. So as we were talking before about the forest road infrastructure, that's where we get the most bang for the buck. And overall, the first, the best thing we could do for flood resilience in these areas is preventing conversion of these forests to something else, and that's already been done. Uh, and and having these uh, state lands that are served uh, in perpetuity. Thank you, Commissioner. Yeah, uh, for the record, Daniel Fitzgerald, Commissioner. Uh, it may be beneficial. I recommend that maybe we bring somebody back to give you a full understanding of how we approach forest management in Vermont. Because the visualization that we're clear cutting is not really the approach that we take. A lot of single selection of species, managing for diversity, regeneration, the next future forest, so that you had a, a presentation earlier about wildfires in Quebec, where it was clear cut. That is not the Vermont way. When you're driving and seeing forests, they are being managed, and you don't see these big swaths of clear cuts. I realize when you look at it on a plan and we identify an area as potential active management, it may look alarming that it's going to be this clear cut, and it's that is not what it is. So we'd be more than happy to understand how it's managed for climate uh, adaptation and mitigation, wildlife, all those things. And, and Vermont really, I think, I'd say gold standard. Then if Pat and then Sabine. Um, uh, I know that the uh, Worcester uh, Planning Commission in their comments, and I believe the Middlesex uh, Planning Commission also in their comments, but I'm not sure about that, uh, has asked you very specifically uh, to, to delay um, uh, uh, implementation of this plan. One of the chief issues in Worcester and Middlesex uh, is the water flows below where you would be doing forestry practices. I think at this point, I know most people in Worcester have had explained to them that there's no clear cutting uh, uh, being, so that is, that is not an issue. The issue is that, as you know, we were within inches of uh, flowing over the spillway at the at the Wrightsville Reservoir, and that will happen again. And so we're not talking about whether it's going to cause an additional foot of water level. We're talking about whether it's going to cause an additional four or five inches of, of water level. And, and that's that's where people are coming from. That's where I'm I'd like to offer, I think what we'd be offering is future protection by growing a healthier, more diverse, complex forest. Okay. And I'll add, there's also significant concern uh, in Montpelier itself, obviously, about that. Representative Sibeli. Yeah. Um, Commissioner, I appreciate your suggestion that we maybe have a more in-depth example of forest management having gone with <laughs> FPR um, uh, on several of those visits with Rural Caucus, understanding uh, I think it's really helpful to get into that level of detail. Um, we, in this committee, uh, I, you know, I appreciate that other communities may have an understanding that we're not clear cutting, but this committee is um, getting a lot of incoming uh, emails from uh, folks. So it would be helpful, I think, for us. And I apologize. I, I don't know. Thank you for your testimony. We should get out in the woods. That would be great. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess. I, I'm going to kind of put a wrap on this, but I, well, I have a question about when was the last time an, a timber sale happened in this management area? Yeah. I, I'd want to double check this, but I think the last one was in 2013. And there, there's a list in the plan of the previous harvests going back to the 80s. And I think there was one in 2013 before that was 
early 2000s. I'd have to look though and uh, verify that. And um, can can one of you speak to why there hasn't been a management plan on this management unit since it's been part of the state's portfolio for a long time? Uh, Daniel Fitzfield, Commissioner. Uh, I don't know for sure, but there are times when we develop a management plan, we put the management, like we have the identified harvest in this proposed plan. Once we get through those, we don't put more on. So we may have gone through all those. And then a lot, a lot of times when we haven't done one in a while, it's because there's a lot of assessments that go into actually the design of prescription and we have a lot of other things that we do. So we we have to prioritize. So if we're working on roads to reduce, to increase resilience of our road network, we have invasive species, we have recreation pressures, we have to prioritize all those. And a lot of times forest management uh, does not fall to the top. So there's usually, it will always delay pretty much in our management activities. So, but I guess, how does a plan, uh, without a plan, how does a timber sale happen and proceed on state land? But that's why, that's why we haven't probably, we've probably gone through them all. And so that's why you're not seeing them in the list of range, I'm, I'm guessing. Gone through them all, sorry. So that in the previous, we had, this is not the first plan. This, we, we've had a list of range management plan before. Oh, and when did it, it I, I guess I had heard that there wasn't one. No, there, there is, there is a previous plan um, that had identified uh, potential commercial harvests. And once we get through everything that's in the plan, we're done. And that's why sometimes doing a new plan or doing amend, we have to we go through a process of amendment or uh, new plans for all the range of management activities, not just vegetation management. Um, great, thank you all. Oh, can I just, yeah. And I, I wanna um, just circle back to, we'll go ahead, Representative Sackerman. Right. Just, just a, a comment on um, really, um, we hear a lot about how agency of natural resources is a, is a science-based um, agency. And I don't doubt for a moment that everything you do is, is science-informed. But I also want to make the point that these sorts of management plans are very complex and require a huge amount of judgment-based decision-making. And a lot of those judgments come from our values. Um, they are often politically informed as well. And I want us to just keep in mind that just because something is science informed doesn't necessarily mean that the decisions that we make um, can't be contested um, because there are different ways to interpret the data and 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 the, and the lens that you look at the scientific data can drastically change how you might act um, based upon that data. I appreciate you sharing that. I mean, absolutely, we are science grounded and it helps make our informed decisions, but we also look at the broad values and benefits and different users. It's really multifaceted. Hence why we go out public scoping and public comments are all part of helping us understand the values of Vermonters. And we're hearing one, we hear a lot. And every issue that comes forward to us, there's always two sides. We hear it on both sides. And so it's a really delicate balance. Um, but we do ground ourselves in, in science, but also the expert opinions and Vermonters' values. But we are charged with that responsibility and we take it very seriously. And as I said, it comes that it comes from a love of the land too, and all of Vermont and our future. It, the staff care deeply and I and are trying to engage with and hear and will respond. Yeah, and also just Hannah Phillips, State Lands Administration Program Manager, um, just to respond to that point as well. Um, I think that's also why it's so compelling <laughs> to the district stewardship teams developing the plans and recommending them. And I think one thing I just want to point out about this plan is um, from the point that the district stewardship team drafted this, recommended it through the agency lands team, which is the directors, and passed it up to leadership to review before it went out to the public to review and comment. There were no changes. The recommendations of the district stewardship team staff prevailed. So that, um, I think that's very grounding in how we develop our plans, that it is it is those experts that are writing them that are recommending them through all the way up to the, the highest level of the agency. 
So um, that is our bell and we need to put a wrap on this meeting. And I just want to say thank you so much, all of you for your hard work. And I know it's all about passion that we have for our, um, our forest broadly and our state lands in particular. I appreciate that you are. I'm surprised it's only two sides. I suspect it's multiple. Well, yeah. <laughs> um, I do want to circle back on, I would like more information on roads, the road infrastructure and how they're being managed. I think that um, we need to know about that. And also the differences of the management types. We need the specifics to understand even, I mean, is it, uh, are those definitions in the plan and the roads in the plan? I mean, I, okay. So um, that's the kind of thing we need more of. And we will also hear more about um, from Bob Zeno at a future date. And thank you again for coming in. You're adjourned for the morning. <laughs>